Lorraine Ball, thank you for coming on Inner Edison. I really appreciate it. Oh, I am so excited to be here. Thanks for the invite. Oh, my pleasure. Um, before we started, we were talking all over the place, and I said, we need to get this on back on here because it's important for people to know. Like one of the things is with the Inner Edison podcast, I stopped at October of 22 because I felt that it was going in the wrong direction for where I wanted. Um, I'm going to back the screen off. It's a little too big to see all my whiskers on my face today. Uh, <laughs> I bought, I bought blades, but they're for the wrong handle. And I'm like, I have not had time this week to go back to the store. And I'm like, oh, heck, I'll just don't worry about it. But the issue was, is I was doing the podcast for two, almost two years. And I'm, and it was all about your, you know, we, your greatest confidence come from your greatest defeats. And that's what it was from the beginning for a, lo a long ways. And then all of a sudden, I lost that because so many people wanted to come on the podcast and I wasn't picking the right people. And it's important. And it's everybody has a story but it's got to make sense for the podcast. And that's mm -hmm. where I left. And that I said, I don't care who I lose. And it's been about six months and I'm sure I'll, I still look and people keep coming back, but it's like, okay, I'm going to start this May 1st. It's been a while. It's important to have the right information on here. And that's why, and we were talking about the same thing that happened to you. You had, mm -hmm. you've had your podcast for 13 years and lost a co-host and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that, Sometimes you do need to step back and look at where you are and maybe it's working, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's generating a lot of revenue and it's not fun. So when you get up in the morning, you're like, I don't even want to do this. To me, that's a, that's a failure too. And it's a good time to step back and go, okay, so what is it I want? What should this be about? And accept the fact that sometimes you're going to pivot and drive in completely the opposite direction and that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I've had. So, do you? Does your is yours drive revenue for your podcast? Is is it paid for? No, um, okay. my podcast. Well, okay, I, my. I'm podcast, not talking about. Yeah, so you don't have. You're the sponsor of your podcast. Yeah. Oh yeah, because the original vision for the podcast, I was running a digital agency, and I did that for a long, long time. And the podcast was great lead generation for me as a way of introducing how we thought about marketing to prospective customers. And it also fueled my my public speaking because I like to uh, run around the country and talk to people. My mother said I was born talking and <laughs> clearly she was right. Yeah, there's, I mean, well, I think we all like to be on stage for a while there. I mean, there's some people who hate it, but that's okay, mm -hmm. you need to get over that. Uh, but it's important, like I see that my radio show is, uh, I pay for it to go on, but mm -hmm. we, you know, 50% of my business comes from my radio show for my mortgage company for me. So it's worth the cost mm -hmm. and it's important I, to get this stuff out there. Absolutely. And for me, the, the podcast is my husband says that it's a good hobby because it's not very expensive. It's loads of fun. Um, and after doing it, as long as I've done it, I have made connections all over the world. And so when I go traveling, whether it's um, Arizona or Australia, I got people to visit. Yeah. I'm amazed how many Australians I had on my show. You know what I mean? There's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like I've been all, and it's like they were, you know, landlocked there for a while there during mm -hmm. the pandemic. So they couldn't mm -hmm. do anything. So of course they were like trying to get on every podcast possible, <laughs> but it's important to understand where you want to go in life and what you want to do, because you might not start off exactly the way you know, what you start to do today is going to be different than it is a year from now or how you're doing anything else. And that's, and people don't realize that. And they need to really, you need to put a plan together what you're going to do, but then understand you're going to have to pivot many different ways for whatever's moving forward. But mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about all day about me. So this is about <laughs> you today. And I, we were talking before the show and I'm like, I want to make sure you understand that, you know, you have to talk about failures because it's so mm -hmm. important for people to understand this will happen and i was i brought up the brian smith episode where he you know the ug founder who brought uggs mm -hmm. to america and how he actually lost the, his business right mm -hmm. and he had to work to get it back and mm -hmm. that's that's a huge failure but he was able to open up and talk about it and i met him a, a, a couple years ago in san diego at an event it was the first time he was talking about it and he actually cried during the thing mm -hmm. and and the guy that was hosting goes i've heard him speak about it so many times but this is the mo one time that i've seen him that emotional about it and that's mm -hmm. important to understand it we all hate failure we don't like it we have to understand it and move on mm -hmm. we hate making mistakes and i'm the worst at that i'm a corpsman from the navy if mm -hmm. i made a mistake somebody died and so mm -hmm. that's my background really hates making mistakes so, so um 
I'm completely the opposite. Um, I I think that um, I'm perfectly comfortable making mistakes. And I, uh, as a, te a former teacher, I think that's how you learn. You know, if everything always goes smoothly, you are unprepared when you get out into the real world and, and you hit you hit that roadblock. And I um, I don't mind doing things half baked. I am perfectly comfortable saying things and then going, you know what? I just heard that out loud. Let's back up. But that's my personality. Um, and I, so I'm, I'm really the, the 180 where, OK, didn't work. So what's next? Doesn't mean I like it. Um, and I certainly um, have had some opportunities to um, come face to face with some of my failures that perhaps my employers or customers did not think um, about the same way I did. But, um, you know, that's that's all part of it. Um, you know, one of my. Uh, before you I get into your fail, before you get into that kind of stuff, I, I had a question. I want to go back. You said teacher. I didn't see that in your bio. Um, my undergraduate degree because you're, because you're, because you said teacher, but your bio says, uh, hosted a successful entrepreneur, author, professional speaker, uh, spending many years in corporate America. She had said goodbye to bureaucracy, glass ceilings, and bad coffee and her passion for helping small businesses succeed. And then about your digital toolbox mm -hmm. and certain things like that. But I, it didn't, I was, so I was, when you said that, I was like, Hmm. Well, my undergraduate degree was in elementary education. And okay. I have taught at the university level. I've been a corporate trainer. And when I started my business, one of the things that I learned was that if I could put six prospective customers in the room, one real customer walked out. And so teaching is part of what I do. Um, but my bio starts to get a little bit long um, <laughs> if I start putting and college professor and, and, and. So I kind of focus on the things that um, are, are more recent or just more um, more related to what I'm doing now, but teacher at heart. Yeah, well, that's what chat GPT is for. <laughs> Drop it in there until just shorten it down with all the information, the most important uh, information, and it will for you. It's, it's, yeah. I know as a teacher, you hate it, but that's how that is. It works really well. Yeah. Well, you, you know what? Um, I've, uh, I've gotten over it. My initial reaction to chat GPT was, oh, hell. Oh, can I say that? Yeah, that's uh, not, okay. we have no kids on here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, hell no. Um, and now where I am with AI is I like it to get me started. And then I'll go back and I'll put it in my own voice and everything. But every now and then I will get an interesting idea that maybe I did not think about as I was thinking about an article or a blog post or a podcast and it will pop up with something and I'll be like, oh, that's something I should explore. So I think it has its place. So I, I love it. No, sorry. go ahead. No, good. I apologize. I was going to say, um, I don't think it's going to replace me, but I do think it's going to make it a lot easier for me to do some things. Well, for me, right, I'm a redneck, even though I have my bachelor's and master's, but I, where I'm from, I'm a redneck. I love reading, or I should say, I love listening to Audible. I hate reading. I hate writing. I can do it. I just don't like to. It's not my favorite thing. And, you know, I had I wrote a book, came out this year, Financial Freedom, Building First uh, Personal Wealth Through Home Ownership. And that was, luckily, I had somebody helping me with that, mm -hmm. right? Because if I did it myself, I would never have gotten it done. <laughs> And that's important to know where your failures are. Well, which for me, for chat GPT, what it allows me to do is reword stuff better than what I would have just had it done and, and re make it sound so much better than what I would normally do. And that's why, and I use it for creating my tags and my hashtags mm -hmm. and all this stuff. When I set up all my lives and everything else I do, I just tell, Hey, create this and create the title, this, 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 as long as you can ask the right questions, it works really well. The problem is people don't know how to ask the right questions. People don't know how to write, ask the right questions. And the other thing that they're not doing, and I think this is a real failing, is they're taking ChatGPT at face value. And they're just, oh, that's what it came back with, good. And what starts to happen is everybody's content looks similar after a while. Um, a lot of what I've read with ChatGPT, when I let it just kind of do its thing, there's good information there. Mm -hmm. But as a teacher, I would grade the paper as a C plus B minus. And I'm good. I'm good with that. 
And, <laughs> and that's okay in certain instances, but in other instances, you really want to go for that little bit extra. So go ahead and do that. Start with the chat GPT yeah. and then overlay you on top of it. Yeah, because it's really not in your words. So you have to make sure it's in your words. And, mm -hmm. and then a lot of people take, so it depends. And I, again, on how you ask or what you tell it is, mm -hmm. whatever you tell that is how it's going to write. If you mm -hmm. tell it it's an eighth grader or a third grader, it's going to write as the third grader, eighth grader. But mm -hmm. if you tell it's the expert in this industry for this, this, and this, it will write it that way to make it sound so much better. Oh, but enough yeah. about chat GPT, because that's not what this podcast is about. But I just it's it helps us as business owners or anybody to write so much better and not need a copywriter as much because for the, my shows, I, my radio scripts, everything I do, it's easier for me to get it done in a few minutes than wait for somebody to write it and give it back to me in three hours. Mm -hmm. right? And then, Absolutely. oh, I want this changed here. Oh, that's another hour. No, it's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. What got you to leave corporate America? And I, you know, cause a lot of people, I, I did horribly in corporate America cause I was in the Navy. I knew I would be horrible in it because I'm not really good at someone telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. Who's over me just because they've been there a few days longer than me. So, um, there was a, a book by Peter Drucker called uh, thriving on chaos. And I'm listening to this interview with him and he's talking about the fact that corporations need to hire crazy people, not just people with interesting resumes, but out and out crazy people. And so I went running down the hall to my boss and I said, okay, um, have you heard this? This is, this is really brilliant. We should do this. And he looks over the table at me and he says, why do you think we hired you? <laughs> Oh, okay, got it. And so for a significant period of, of time in that job and, and um, actually in another job, I was the crazy person. And that was okay. That was a role I loved. I could do outlandish things. I could do entrepreneurial things. I could do Skunk Works projects. And that was great. Where I slammed into the end of my career at corporate is when the management and the leaders who hired me to be that moved on, got promoted, new people came in and they didn't understand that that was, that that's who I was, that I was not the square peg that they, they put in the little square box or that I really was kind of that square peg. They were shoving me in a round hole, trying to cut my corners off. It wasn't working. And that ultimately was when I went, okay, this is not where I need to be anymore. And so I started an agency called Roundpeck. And it was somewhere that I fit. And it was somewhere that um, pretty much everybody I hired over the 20 years I ran the company, you could say that we were the island of misfit toys. We were the people that just did things differently and it suited us and but that that was really the end of of my corporate days when i realized that i could no longer be the crazy one because i was right well you know they say entrepreneurs if you read the things that have to do with autism you know what you ask mm -hmm. these are you the this the, the, you could you ask those to, to a group of entrepreneurs in a room they're all going to raise their hand on on pretty much 90 percent of it <laughs> to be on the autism scale and it's so true and that's mm -hmm. because we're so not that's why we do well on our own and do certain mm -hmm. things better than other people but now before the show, we're kind of talking about failures and I want to talk about the corporate one for now and we'll get into the business one later. Um, so what would you say your greatest failure was that, you, you know? Ah, so um, I was working for a company. Now, you have to um, you have to look at this failure in the it, through the lens of the fact that this was 25 years ago. The Internet was a new thing. Online gaming was uh, was was new and most people weren't doing it yet. And we had this idea for this promotion that we would run a contest. We were going to launch our new website. And my job was to come up with a promotion to get people to come to the website and surf around, to look at multiple pages and to give us their contact info, right? Those were my three assignments. We came up with this idea, working with our agency, to do an online game. You came back every week. 
you answered a trivia question. The questions were actually, you could find the answers on our website and um, you could win like a small prize each week and you were entered for this, a chance at a million dollars. It was insured through Lloyd's of London. You know, if you got this final question right. We spent a fortune promoting it. We um, we were actually the title sponsor at our at our uh, at the uh, the field house here in Indianapolis where the the Pacers played at the time. We set up a hundred computer terminals so when people were coming into the stadium, they'd see these terminals and they would play, and we had their contact information. And so at the end of the promotion. My agency was blown away. Oh my God, Lorraine, this is this is like the most incredible, incredible promotion we've ever done. We had thousands and thousands and thousands of people sign up, come to the website, surf around. We had page views, we had visits. I was thrilled. Traffic to the website, check. People signing up, check. Um, looking at multiple pages, there was only one little problem. The average person who was playing online games at the time, and even now today, is a young man, 18 to 25. Our average customer was a woman, 55 and older. <laughs> sales? You wanted sales? No. You told me you wanted clicks, you wanted views. Look, those people are going to grow up. They're going to marry those women. And... 30 years from now, they'll be good customers. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah just, no. a little, uh, just a little thing. Yeah. So, so oh. the, the lesson clearly was um, not, and, and it has served me very well in my digital marketing career, is not becoming enamored with the wrong metrics. Right. Know, know who your yeah. customer is. Well, know who your customer is, but also, you know, this whole idea, I mean, even people who know who their customer is, even if I hadn't screwed that up, the metrics of traffic, views, clicks <coughs> did not equate to sales. So did it really matter? Well, I mean, and this is not to get political or anything. It's the same thing that just happened with Budweiser. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's unfortunate that they what happened with the negative stuff that has happened. You're right there. Yeah. Okay. I'm just saying there's, you do certain things thinking you're going to get a different outcome and it completely goes the opposite way. You just never really know. So you really got to check it. And back in the, I remember in the nineties, I mean, internet just came out and the problem is it was so slow. It was horrible website. There was nothing to it. And if you didn't, I mean, today, if you knew the company name, you can Google it and find it or, you know, duck, duck, go, whatever you want and find them right in seconds. Back then it'd take forever. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you did, yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, it, I mean, and, and it was a different time, but um, yeah, the, the, to this day, it haunts me, <laughs> you know, when I think about all the money that we spent and, how big that promotion really was and what a glorious failure because yeah. it just completely missed the mark yeah i mean because i did a lot of drug mail during the 90s and i loved the fact that i could get the phone to ring with the right client you know which was mm -hmm. hard the way we had choices and how mm -hmm. now you can you know narrow it down so much differently than back then but it's still you need to know who that client is and how to get there and sometimes people lose when they're trying to do this whole thing and they look at that instead of where it's going to get us. But. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that, that, that was, that was my very glorious um, corporate failure. Yeah. Well, you, know, you learn from it. Yeah. yeah. I've had, I've had uh, employees cost me thousands and thousands of dollars and mm -hmm. it's, and there was like, you're going to fire me. I'm like, no, because I couldn't teach that again. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, that but, mistake you're going to learn and never make again and tell everybody else not to make that mistake again. Absolutely. You can, I will never, I will never get mad. If you make a mistake, I will get really mad if you make the same mistake twice. Yeah. 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 You know? yeah. yeah. Why are you costing? Uh, you should learn it from the first time and then make changes. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's how it should be. Absolutely. But I don't, I don't think, I think we were talking originally, we were talking about the certain things you were doing and, um, 
and it brought me up to sales out with knowledge right when we're sell he said if you brought six people in the room one would come out of it i mean mm -hmm. we we educate people now right we don't mm -hmm. sell we educate mm -hmm. them and bring them down a path through that education to get them to where we want to go and that education is so important and i think it, you need to do that today more than we've ever had to do it before oh absolutely I, that was that was always my business model and it was comfortable for me and so when I started seeing how content marketing and inbound marketing was going and it was embracing this idea of teaching, that was a that was a fun. That was definitely a fun path to take because it felt comfortable and it felt right. And it you got to that moment where you weren't trying to overcome objections at the close, because if you did, if if you do your job right through the process, educating, explaining, by the time you get to that end of that conversation, the person knows enough to know whether or not you're the right person and they either hire you or they don't. And it's easy and you're free to move on. So looking back at that failure when you're talking about, because it was a gaming thing that you guys did, right? Game. Mm -hmm. And it would maybe, was it just the wrong game? Maybe. <sighs> um, I mean, because a lot of women play games now, you know, like that, those, you know, that farmland and other stuff you know but I, i'm just curious I, I i think what would you um, have done what would have been better what would have been a better thing for them so i think um the i i think the the first thing was the whole idea about gaming i think the difference today would have been the game itself was not a bad idea the trivia quiz i think would have applied to our audience looking at the number of women who play wordle and waffle and all the new york times games um i think women like like to play games and i i don't they it's not the kind of shoot them up or you know um uh, whatever war games that i think mm -hmm. perhaps appeal more to that 18 to 25. i think that was it i just think we didn't understand that our market, and it sounds so strange to say it today because everybody's online and everybody's on the internet, but 25 years ago, our community, women 55 and older, that was not where they were playing. Uh, the contest would have been better if we'd found figured out a way to do a live event through um, local YMCA's or uh, through clinics. We were an insurance company. We could have run it, you know, through um, partnering with health fairs or something that was more likely to reach the people. I mean, doing it at the basketball game, again, mm -hmm. our, our audience wasn't there. Um, you know, yes, there are women who go to basketball, but you look at that crowd and it, it's a lot of younger people and it's a lot of guys. And that wasn't the audience for that product. All right. So you left, uh, the corporate world, started your mm -hmm. own agency. And during that, did you have any issues during your agency? I mean, are you, you're not, you're not still running that agency, right? Um, I ran it for 20 years and I sold it. Um, okay. and I'm two years past that. And, and it's been a lot of fun because I'm back to being able to do the podcast full time, doing some teaching and training, speaking around the country, the things I loved best. Um, if I could sum up the biggest mistake that I made, and you would have think, thought that I had learned it because I, I made the same mistake once in corporate, it's, um, that people don't always like broccoli and, by that, I mean that broccoli is really good for us and we should eat broccoli. That does not mean we want to eat broccoli. And I walked away from corporate. One of the things that, besides being crazy, um, one of the things that I did really well was fix dysfunctional teams. I, you know, if there was an, if there was a team that was broken, if there was high turnover, if there were issues, they call me in and say, OK, this is your problem now. Go in there and don't come out till you fix it. And that was fun for me and I was good at it. And I thought, you know, I've I've developed some systems that work. That's what I'm going to do when I leave corporate. Everybody, every manager needs to know what I know about building high performance teams. And corporations should pay for this. 
The problem was I was 20 years too early because you see, when I left corporate, unlike today, there were more people than jobs. You had high unemployment and so companies didn't care. Oh, you wanna quit? Bye bye now, we'll find somebody else to do your job. So me coming along, talking to corporate execs, but turnover costs you money and trying to sell team building and, and exercises to build high performance teams, it didn't work. It completely did not work because it was broccoli. It was good for them and they did not want it. And um, I held on to that for uh, maybe a year trying to build that business. And along the way, I had people who I'd run into go, you used to do marketing, right? Yeah. Can you help me with this? Yeah, I'll take that project, but that's really not what my business is about. And after about a year, I woke up one day and I went, wow, <laughs> that is what my business is about. Um, and, and so um, I did something that I still think is was absolutely the right thing. Um, there's an expression about, you know, my, my brother told me that, that like when I was first talking about the business, he said to me, I said, well, you know, if it doesn't work, I can always go back to corporate. And he says, no, you, you can't. You have to sail to the island and burn the boat. Yeah. Because if you have that safety valve, you'll always live with one foot in the boat and one foot on shore. You'll never really do it. And so at the end of the year, when I realized that nobody wanted broccoli, but a lot of people wanted my marketing, I called up a friend of mine and I said, hey, you do some corporate consulting, right? She's like, yeah. I said, you know, and you do some, some team building. Mm -hmm. I got a present for you. And I sent her 850 contacts, people that I thought were good targets. I said, here, take these, do what you want with them because I ain't gonna. And in that moment, I burned the bridge. There was no going back um, and it set me free. I stopped living with one foot in the corporate world and one foot in the entrepreneurial world and uh, made camp on the island of uh, small businesses and misfit toys and lived happily ever after. I was waiting for the misfit toys. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Then, um, Because you said uh, it earlier before we yeah. were on. So, oh, yeah. well, you know, um, well, I, and I know that a lot of people don't get the reference, but, you know, um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, yeah. watch it yeah. and um, uh, the old find one. the elf who... Yeah. yeah, yeah, the original where the elf wants to be a dentist. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, and it's... that's a, and okay. and that's a sad thing these days that a lot of references people don't know. Like you said, half baked. Mm -hmm. Half the people are thinking she's smoking marijuana. You know, a quarter <laughs> of them you're thinking. You know, it depends on that generation you're from that's listening to this. Mm -hmm. You know, because there was a you know movie half baked by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you yeah. know, it's like yeah. Yes. No. Um, well, yeah. Okay. We're not going to even talk about that. We're just going to move on from that. Um, but that's uh, one of the things that's funny because I teach it in um, uh, my marketing class. You know, one of the one of the most effective kind of headlines is if you get the cultural reference right. right. But the challenge is that the audience, if you don't really understand your audience, you may throw out a cultural reference that they don't get. You know, you asked me before we went on the air. Uh, about my last name. And you said, any relation to, and I shook my head. Well, the funny thing is you were probably referring to Lucille Ball. Mm -hmm. I live in Indiana where the Ball brothers um, were a very successful company and they actually have a university named after them. And so here, the cultural reference, when somebody says, oh, are you related to, I ain't related to them either. Um, mm -hmm. But that was the first thing that popped into my head. And then after we were talking, I was like, oh, I bet he was asking about Lucille. Uh, yeah, well, it didn't matter. You were not related anyway. But you did do your you did do your DNA testing just in case, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, remember that. Okay, so I married. This is my husband's last right, name. Right, right, so yeah, right, yeah exactly. they know so him DNA. related. I'm just saying his DNA test. Because it's funny because I have so many, you know, my last name is Parco, which has to do with French and everything. But over there, it's they add an L in. And when I did my DNA testing, it's like, yeah, fifth and sixth and seventh. And it's like, what? How do I, you know? And it's like, you're not, to me, after cousins, they're not family. But, you know, I guess <laughs> in some places there are. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, well, All right. So, it, 
Go ahead. Yeah, because because we no, can go down that say, whole we can go down that whole address ancestry thing. But Ian, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> people don't want to know. They want they want to know your mistakes, and you already told them your your two big ones that you mm -hmm. focus on. Um, all right, so now you do podcasting, speaking, and and teaching, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? And what do yeah. you teach? Um, marketing. Um, so traditional and digital marketing. Um, I um, because I spent eleven years in the heating and air conditioning industry. Contractors and contractor groups are always my happy place. So I do. You know, you'll find me teaching marketing at um, a uh, security conference or at a conference for HVAC contractors, and it's it's fun because they're not jaded you know you, you you do a presentation on marketing to a room full of marketers and everybody thinks they can do it better than you so you know i don't need that um and then i also occasionally teach at the university level i may go back in the fall um and and start doing that again because i really really like working with um young professionals at the beginning of their career and uh seeing how they do it totally different than I would and learning how to bite a hole through my tongue because it's not how I would do it. I was talking to somebody else. They were talking about the same thing as you when you're relating to them and it's a phrase from their, you know, and mm -hmm. the guy was saying, you know, if I have a conversation with somebody and I say bet, which is, I guess is a, a young thing. And he's like, if I use it a certain way, they'll, they'll, they'll laugh at me because mm -hmm. I'm they're thinking the old guy is trying to use this term mm -hmm. but if I do a reference to it and how to and then it, they totally relate to it and it's mm -hmm. important how you talk to your demographics you're supposed to be mm -hmm. talking to and I think a lot of people just don't understand that still to this day and you need to really know who what's your who is your perfect client you need to niche it down go after mm -hmm. the niche because that's where the that's where the money is I mean even I I do uh, veteran loans business mm -hmm. owners and reverse mortgages that's still not niched down i should just do veteran loans mm -hmm. but the problem is that's only eight percent in my market mm -hmm. i would starve <laughs> yeah well you know that that's the other thing is that you know you can niche too too far i had a guy who came to me one time and um fortunately i prevented him from having a glorious failure he had this idea and it take me way too long to explain the whole business model but i was like okay let's let's really talk about it and he was going to have a retail location. He'd already picked out the location and I made him park in the parking lot and count the number of people that looked like they fit his demographic going into three or four different stores there. And he came back and I said, so how many was it? And I said, and that was a Wednesday afternoon and he did it on a Saturday. Now, not all of them are going to buy your product. So now let's, let's break it down and let's say it's a third of that. Do you make enough money? And he's like, well, that would be one sale every like other day. I'm like, mm -hmm. So do we have a problem with that? And, you know, so sometimes you can't over niche. Yeah. And you have to be careful with, I mean, because mm -hmm. maybe brick and mortar doesn't work for you. That's why online mm -hmm. does very well or, you know, this or that. And that's, you know, that's why McDonald's, you know, they spend so much money to find out where to put their place. And then mm -hmm. all the other fast foods just go, where do McDonald's go? Mm -hmm. Let's go right there. <laughs> oh yeah, that, okay. That that's why CVS is always across the street from Walgreens. You know, um, McDonald's is across the street from Burger King. Yeah. Well, they were the McDonald's was their first. Burger King came in second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how that works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then they geofence the McDonald's so they when as you walk in there, you get the notice. Hey, you come over here, you get two dollars off. At <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love I love technology when it works. Yeah. And that's, again, you have to, and again, don't rely on technology for everything. It's the most important thing is time in front of the client. That's the most mm -hmm. FaceTime and time, you know, pick up the phone, stop calling. I mean, stop texting, stop doing all this other stuff. Cause I've had some people, I do a lot with go high level and there's this new stuff they're sending out. It's like, people don't want to talk. So why make them? It's like, that's fine. But I am what I do. Cause it's a high ticket. I create mm -hmm. one of the largest debts in your life. I have to talk to you. I want to oh. make sure you understand what I'm talking about. And that's why I wrote my book. That's why I do the radio show. So people can get that education to them. And then when they talk to me, it's a lot less time to understand that. You know, they, they see, I hear a lot of, oh, people don't want to talk. We did something with the agency that um, we did not have voicemail. The phone rang, someone answered it. And they answered it on the first ring. End of discussion. And people would call and they'd be like, oh, 
oh, you, you're a real person. You're not an answering machine. And I was like, no, I'm a real person. Who do you want to talk to? What do you need? Um, we got clients over and over and over again because they said you were the only agency that answered the phone. I got radio interviews and television interviews because all of the networks in town knew if they were running a story on a Friday afternoon and they needed a five minute quote from somebody in the industry, they knew if they called my phone, they would get me. And so people don't want to talk to you until they want to talk to you. Right. And you need to be prepared. And I, I laughed because every time I'd hire a new person, you know, first year out of college, the phone would ring and they'd be like, I'm like, no, here's the deal. This is your first week on the job. Phones get answered on the first ring, first ring and nobody else in the building is going to pick it up. Welcome to Round Peg. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, get- it was great. Yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to, mm-hmm. I got so much business for people go, well, you, you're the only one that actually re- answered the phone or called us back. Right. Because if we are so busy that there, I don't care how many people we have and how many extra services we have to answer. There was a point there for two years. We couldn't talk enough, you know, during the pandemic, we had so much business coming in, mm-hmm. we couldn't get back. And we got so much business just by answering the phone. So mm-hmm. you're right. Yeah. It's it it's still so people want to connect with somebody and you can really connect with somebody by talking to them and hearing the, in their tones and inflections and their voice. I just did a live on this because I do another uh, sales thing too called Aces 53 and talk about tonality and how it come, you come across. And one of the guys was like, you know, we're not taught this as a kid. I go, well, technically we are. When your mom yells at you with your full first, your full name, that's mm-hmm. the first of tonality that you learn to understand i'm in trouble mm-hmm. you just we're not taught how to use it as well that's first. yeah my kids um instead of getting their full name they knew they were in trouble when um they could hear their name uh with a new york accent if i started channeling my mother they were in trouble I could see that with us, they knew they're in trouble when we finally got to their name. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, uh, Blake, uh, City, uh, you know, you, you just are trying to get the name out and you're throwing all the other names out first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lorraine. The, uh, I was going to say, my, my husband, no. there were three boys and two dogs. And when my mother in law was really mad, she ran through all of them until, you know, they were like, okay, if, if she's had Brownie and Beauty, we are in big trouble. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it was like, you can never get a rename right. Well, there's so many of you. Can't help it. <laughs> Lorraine, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. And um, anything else you want to add before we go? Um, you know what? When they're done listening to this, if they'll hop over and look for more than a few words, wherever they listen to a podcast, that would be great. And you have, is your website more than a few words too? More than a few words.com. Uh, yeah. I didn't mean add on the T-O-O too. All right. I thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Check out her website, more than a few words.com, uh, Lorraine ball. And again, thank you for wa- uh, watching or thank you for listening. And if you like what we do here, just subscribe and share, please. And again, Lorraine, thank you so much. Thank you.